Welcome to the Cosmic Connection. This is your place to explore the beauty and order of the cosmos. And your connection to it all. My name is Amanda Poole Walsh, and I'm the founder of Astrology Hub. And I'm Rick Merlin Levine, your Cosmic Navigator. Now let's dive in. Let's do it. All right. Hello and welcome, everybody. Today, we are here for a very special episode of The Cosmic Connection. We are continuing our exploration of harmonic aspects and especially as they relate to our relationships. So I don't know about all of you, but sometimes there's this sense that there is more than meets the eye when it comes to our relationship dynamics, that there's things that are sort of hidden from us that are impacting the way that we relate with the people in our lives. And so Rick is going to talk here today with us about how harmonic aspects may be giving us some clues into those more subtle factors that are definitely impacting the way that we uh, engage with the people in our lives. Yeah? Yeah. Hi. Hi, Amanda. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, Hi, Rick. Yes. Um, no, this, <clears throat> you know, th this whole process of getting ready and, and creating the curriculum for the uh, harmonic aspects course that, that you guys are, are running, that we're running, has been a total reinvigorating of this. I mean, I've been working with these things for 40 years, more. Oh, my God. Um, <clears throat> but in doing the preparation for the, for the classes and for recording them, I am just so excited because i forget because we all do if something isn't in front of us it's like you know, what's that saying out of sight out of mind you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. um and and i recall this quote which has been a favorite quote of mine of my favorite greek philosopher of whom i know absolutely nothing about other than his name <laughs> and that's heraclitus huh. and heraclitus uh, wrote or at least it's attributed to him, uh, the following. The hidden harmony is always better than the obvious. Oh, interesting. It's a great line. The hidden harmony is always better than the obvious. And and for years, I've been teaching that uh, there's an old phrase in computer technology called WYSIWYG, which mm. stood for what you see is what you get. And the Macintosh was like a major breakthrough because it featured WYSIWYG. Prior to that, you had all this gobbledygook and control characters on the screen, and you wouldn't know what it was like until you printed it. But with the Macintosh, and now with everything, is what you see is what you get. And the letters spell out WYSIWYG. And I've always said that that's great for computers, but the universe is WYSIWYG. What you see is not what you get. <laughs> We're back to the hidden harmony is better than the obvious. And and the same is true um, in all aspects of, of life. And I know we're kind of focusing on relationships, but I want to be clear. We're not talking about intimate relationships only. I mean, we certainly are. But we're talking about my relationship with you and your relationship with me. We're talking about your relationship with your kids and with your parents and with the checkout person at the supermarket. All interactions with other people are a function of that self and other, mm. you know, that inside outside. So mm -hmm. when we talk about relationships, yes, it includes intimate or romantic relationships, but it's certainly not limited to that. So I just needed to be clear with that at the beginning because because when we do astrology and we look at relationships, there's a number of tools we can we can look at. Um, the primary tool for astrology looking at relationships is called synastry. And synastry, the, the 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 beginning of the word is made up of two Greek words, syn s y n, not s i n. Don't get excited. Uh, the s y n is the same syn as in a synonym. And it means the same as or with along a lot as one as one would be a good way to say it. And the second part is a familiar um, that's astri or astro. 
And it's like when you take two charts and you compare one with the other and you bring them together, that's what sin astry or the um, putting putting a relationship together. And with sinistry, we're really always looking at two charts. We're looking at, let's say, my chart and your chart, or we're looking at Bob's chart and Mary's chart. Um, it doesn't matter as long as there's two people involved. We can be looking at mom and dad. For that matter, we can be looking at dad and dad. Doesn't matter as long as there's two people involved. And what we do astrologically is we make a list of what each planet in my chart does to the planets in your chart, the aspects. So let's say, for example, I'm in Aries. My son is at 16 degrees of Aries. And let's say I meet someone and their Venus um, is at 16 degrees of Leo. Well, that person's Venus would be trine or harmonized, fiery Leo to fiery um, uh, Aries. They would be trine. And so what we do is you make a table and you show what every planet in your chart does aspect wise to the planets in my chart. That's actually a very different list than the list that we would make for you with what my planets do to your planets. I mean, they look like they're the same, but if your Saturn is, um, let's just make it really simple. If your Saturn is lined up with conjoined my Mars, um, that means you're going to be the Saturn person. I'm going to be the Mars person. I'm going to be running off into the walls and doing all kinds of things and running around. And you're going to be saying, no, you can't do that until you take out the trash or whatever. And so the roles in this is very different. Now, most astrologers use this technique with the traditional aspects. And so we would look at the relationships between all those planets and look at their conjunction and their opposition and their square, and their trines, and their sextiles. Um, and some, as, some astrologers might also look at their quincunxes, taking it a step beyond the Ptolemaic aspects. Um, but when we step into the realm of harmonic aspects, and again, harmonic aspects, the simplest explanation is that every aspect is based upon a division of a circle. An opposition divides a circle by two. That means that it's like a full moon. It's dividing the, the moon cycle in half. And so the opposition dividing the circle by two is the second harmonic. It's that simple. It's just languaging. The trine, 120 degrees, which is a smooth and easy and flowing aspect, divides the circle by three because the trine is 120 degrees. And that's one third of a circle. So that's the third harmonic. And that does fine as long as we take numbers that divide into the zodiac. One, two, three, and four all go evenly into 12. Six goes evenly into 12. But when we go to five, seven, eight, nine, 10, and 11, those numbers fall through the astrological cracks. And um, we'll be spending a lot of time in the Harmonics um, Foundations 3 course looking at these other aspects and seeing them in natal charts. That's what we'll be exploring in birth charts. However, it works just as well in synastry. Mm -hmm. And you meet someone, I mean, we've all met someone who we meet them and all of a sudden we can't explain it. We're really different. And it's just like, I know this person or they, they, or, or there's, and again, it doesn't even have to be someone we really know. It's just, it could be someone that we see on TV. It could be someone we walk by on the street. And sometimes we just get a buzz. Well, sometimes it's because that person's Jupiter is lined up with our moon and it makes us feel bountiful because it's their Jupiter kind of being where our moon is. But what if it's connected to our moon by one seventh of a circle or two sevenths or three sevenths? Seven is a really weird number because you divide 360 degrees by seven and you come up with these numbers that never a number like pi that just is a, it's irrational. You can't even you can't even think of a number that makes it real because it's just weird. Nature doesn't use a lot of sevens. It uses numbers that are harmonious. And so the seven, and I'm just picking this out as one example, the seven is an aspect that is, it's, uh, it's otherworldly, um, it's irrational, 
it, it, it's intriguing. It's, um, it can be um, aha, like an invention being discovered, like, like lightning striking. It can have a Uranian flavor, Uranus, that kind of breakthrough, but it also can be like, um, like, like aliens, ghosts, goblins, mysterious things that don't fit into this three-dimensional world. What happens if I have a relationship based upon septiles? Which it turns out when you look at synastry and open the door, all of a sudden you begin to realize how active these are. And how do you realize that? Well, when, and, and of course we allow the computer to do all this calculation stuff because it's, I mean, who'd be looking for, you know, an aspect that's just slightly over 51 or just slightly a touch less than 51 and a quarter degrees, 51.24, blah, 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 a number that doesn't end. But the point here is that these aspects are resonating whether we know it or not. And when you look at that aspect grid with what each planet in my chart does with each planet in Fred's chart or anyone else's chart, and you see one of these aspects with an orb of like zero or 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 an orb of a half a degree even that is going to resonate and it always speaks very loudly of the basis of what that relationship is so that's why the hidden harmony is better than than the obvious because it allows us to see things that are not within our normal scope of operation when we do the quote unquote normal or traditional astrology based upon the zodiac based upon right. 12. So basically those relationships where we feel something that we can't quite put our finger on, or there's an underlying dynamic that isn't obvious. It isn't easy to explain. It isn't clear to even ourselves. Often these yeah. harmonic aspects will give us insights into what's operating behind the scenes is essentially. And, right. uh, yes, exactly. Correct. And often what happens is that these harmonic aspects are really just magnifying things that are already being kind of clued into by what we're seeing traditionally. And this is one of the magical things about astrology. Astrologers call this corroboration. Mm. If you see something once in a chart, yeah, oh, that's a possibility. If you see the same thing coming from two different directions, ah, but when you see it, because it's here, it's here, it's here by houses, here by aspects, here by planets, it begins to develop some weight. So for example, um, in astrology, the, the south node, for example, is which relates us often, astrologers believe, to our past. The nodes are where the moon's orbit around the earth intersect the earth's orbit around the sun. And where those two orbits meet up, there's nothing there. It's just an invisible point of energetic interaction. And, and many astrologers believe that the nodes of the moon are directional. We, it comes from the south node moving to the north node. The north node is where, where, the, where the orbit comes up above the equator into the north, northern hemisphere, in effect. Mm -hmm. And as such, many astrologers believe that when you meet someone wh whose south node is on, let's say, your sun or moon or an important planet in your chart, as if any planet is not important, mm -hmm. but when that occurs, it's a past life connection. And, and that's borne out often when you look at um, charts through that sinistry lens, whether or not you're a proponent of using past lives in your work or not, it's indicative of, gosh, there's something about this person that really feels familiar. And it's almost like a, uh, like a thing that, bring, that, that solidifies bringing two people together. And again, I don't mean limited by romantic uh, relationships. But the thing is, is that that south node, which certainly sets that stage, if there are, let's say, numbers of septiles, and I'm just focusing on that for a moment, we'll come back to some of the others in, in, in a moment too. Um, but if you focus on those septiles, you realize that there's something else going on that's not just past life. There's something, it's almost like the the spirit guides are conjuring to bring you two together. Um, I mean, I've heard stories of, uh, of people who didn't realize what a strong relationship they had until something totally out of the blue happened. 
And then it kind of brought them together forever. It solidified it. And remember, Dane Rudyard called the septiles. And when I say septiles, I mean one seventh of a circle, a little bit more than 51 degrees, two sevenths of a circle, uh, about 102 and a half degrees. And these are all about because uh, because they're numbers that aren't resolved. And then the three sevenths, which is about 154 degrees. And so these three septiles, one seventh, a septile, two sevenths, a biceptile, and three sevenths, a triceptile. These are all numbers of this mysterious harmonic resonance that brings us uh, brings consciousness from the other realms, other dimensions. It's not just the past like the moon is. It's like dimensions that are just out of our reach. And there's this whole mysterious thing that, that connect with septiles. But again, septiles are just one of these mysterious aspects. Mm. Okay, before we move on, I just want to make sure everybody knows that the class, the Foundations 3 class is open <clears throat> for enrollment right now. We just released the first module yesterday. Every week for the next four weeks, you're going to get another module, another lesson in these harmonic aspects delivered by Rick. And then yeah, we should get four, four lessons each week. Four lessons within each module. And then uh, weeks five and six are going to be bonus weeks where we're going to he's going to be actually doing live chart demonstrations and live Q&A. So we would love to have you for this class now. If you're super busy and you're not sure if you have enough time to actually take the class now, I would still recommend joining the class now because this is the only time that the promotional pricing is going to be available. So the best price that you'll ever be able to get on this course is happening now. And then um, it will go to our regular retail price and you'll be able to get it later, but it just won't be as um, yeah, you know, the same price. Right. So, and once you get it, you can watch it any, anytime you want. Exactly. It will be added to your library. You can revisit it a million times. You'll have it in, in that learning library. So in this course, are we going to be, how much, how many modules or lessons are going to be spent on looking at relationship aspects? Not, we're not really going, it'll be mentioned in passing, uh, but there's no, the, the direct focus of this chart is in understanding what these aspect mean these aspects mean and how to find them and work with them in your birth or natal chart because a lot of people don't even have a clue as to how do I go about finding my quintiles or my septiles or my octiles, noviles, deciles, or my favorite the 11 tiles which is well it's i mean the the traditional word it's not really traditional the the latin is undeciles because an undecile is 11 but that's so confusing because a decile sounds like it should be 10 because that you know that's uh, you right. know and and so and and so i for years have called them 11 tiles and my friends kind of laugh at me because that's because it's as it, well, and then it goes into one of my whole things. And I did a, a lecture. I think I've told you this off camera once that uh, uh, several years ago, I did a series of lectures called the X tiles, which is when the X files was big and it was called the X tiles. The truth is out there. <laughs> and um, and so it's the you know, it's the quintiles, septiles, octiles, eight, which we know as the half square and square and a half, the semi-square and sesquisquare, many people use those. The octiles, the noviles divided by nine, the deciles by 10, and then my uh, 11 tiles, which are really undeciles. However, um, I've now discovered that many people who are actually studying these in depth and writing about them are using the German word elf for 11, and so now I'm referring to them as elf tiles. It's a little bit more elegant and, and a little bit more mis mischievous. And I kind of like both elegance and mischievous. Both oh, my things. gosh, I love both that. Both of those things are good for me. Yes, <laughs> elf tiles. Okay, if you're interested in joining, you can go to astrologyhub.com slash foundations3, astrologyhub.com slash foundations3. But let's continue our exploration of relationships with these harmonic yeah. aspects because it's my guess that if you understand the foundations of these harmonic aspects, then you can start applying them. That's it. That, that's exactly it. And that's why the course is focusing on what the hell does a 
does a septile or or a novile mean? And why would I want to look? And so in, in, just getting back to the course, I really don't want to focus on that right now. I want to come back to the relationships. But, but when you see enough charts with these aspects as exact as they are of people that you know, all of a sudden you go, holy crap, you know, a David Bowie is a disincarnate alien and he has septiles all over his chart. He's an alien. And that's the aspect of alien, you know, well, or you look at a chart like creativity. Uh, I mean, a chart with aspects of creativity, which is the quintiles, the five pointed star, the magical five pointed star, a sacred geometry. We astrologers don't use that. That five pointed star is the symbol of creativity. And when you see that really strong um, in charts like, like Mozart, for example, all over the place, you realize, my God, he just wrote that music down the way he heard it. It was, there was nothing, it wasn't alien. It was just beautiful. And so that's, once you understand the dynamics and seeing them again and again and again in charts, which we'll do a lot of charts, then it's easy to say, if I meet someone and that person has a lot of planets, quintile, that's one fifth of a circle, 72 degrees. Don't get destroyed by the math here. But if that person has um, planets that are quintile or biquintile, that's two um, fifths. Uh, it's like on a five pointed star, it's two points on that star that are next to each other. That's the quintile. And on that same five pointed star, if you go to two points that are missing one point, like one next door and then one, then one more, that's a biquintile. So let's say I run that synastry and I go, oh my God, there's not a lot of trines here. How sad, because trines are an easy flow of energy, but boy, look at all these quintiles. You don't even have to look at which ones they are. There are a lot of quintiles. This relationship is going to be creative. Mm. It's going to be spiritual. It's going to be manifesting something that wasn't there before. And wow. that may or may not come out from this industry that we know. Wow. I love that. Okay. Question from Lorraine. Are mystic rectangles a part of this harmonic aspect world or not? <laughs> No, and this brings up something else that is that is, that is quite interesting. Um, and, and what you're talking about, Lorraine, is what we call an aspect pattern. Some people call them planetary configurations. I mean, they're called a configuration. And a configuration or an aspect pattern um, is basically when you have three or more planets, there can be many, that are tied up in a picture of some sort that we astrologers give a name to. One of the most common pictures or configurations or aspect patterns that people know is called the grand trine. It's when you, there are three planets, each one trining to other planets. And so it's three planets that are humming or resonating, because remember, harmonics are aspects. And even a trine is a harmonic, it's the third harmonic, one third of a circle. So if you have three planets that are in a grand trine, that's a third harmonic aspect. And that hums. A grand trine is considered to be a blessing because the energy flows, although sometimes it can be a curse because the energy can flow in a way that we try to break out of and it's difficult to break out of. Now, uh, there are many planetary configurations or aspect patterns including a grand trine, a T-square, a grand square, um, a kite, uh, a, a yacht or finger of God. These are all traditional aspects. We're not going to go into them now. They've been defined, oh, certainly in, in Fundamentals 1, we describe these uh, aspect patterns. Um, but the thing is, is that these aspect patterns are based upon the traditional aspects, including the mystic rectangle, which is what Lorraine's question was. Um, I, I did not forget the question. I was laying some groundwork to get back to that because a mystic rectangle is a planetary configuration or planetary pattern that, that, has, a, that has two planets that are sex, sextile to one another. And then one of those planets is trying to another planet which is then sextile to another, which is then trine. And what it creates is a, if you can think of it, it's just like a rectangle, like the shape of your computer screen. Most computer screens are rectangles, not square. The longer side is a trine, the shorter side is a sextile. 
And so it means that with these four planets are in two, their two oppositions, that the corners of your screen on your computer are in opposition to one another. You're in the center. And these planets make a trine sextile, trine sextile in the shape of a rectangle. It's called a mystic rectangle because there's the tension of the oppositions of the of the opposition of the of the the tension of the second harmonic opposition and yet on the outside it shows trines and sextiles so it seems beautiful and smooth and easy and there's something mystical about that ability to hold that tension and not necessarily show it on the outside so the, so no this is not about a mystic rectangle but it is about harmonic um patterns and if you think that the grand trine, T-square, grand square, mystic rectangle, kite, that these configurations are intriguing to you. Well, when you start adding in other harmonics, you get an amazing array of patterns that can be so resonant. I mean, overwhelmingly resonant so that you look in charts, um, you see um, a... a um, uh, a, a teacher like um, um, uh, Ram Das, for example, um, who has three planets in the in the quintile series, quintiles and biquintiles, in this magical. Um, it's kind of like a, a we I call them golden yards because they're based upon the golden mean, the fifth harmonic. Um, we'll cover that in in the class completely. But the point is that these aspects resonate in other harmonics too. And so although the mystic rectangle is a traditional pattern based upon traditional aspects, you can tweak these patterns and, and see that they that there is a whole universe of music, of chords, of harmonies that we miss in these patterns. And again, if you have one of these patterns in your natal chart, and then you meet someone who resonates with these same harmonic patterns to yours, boom, this is like a total in-depth resonance. And there's a, a wonderful book by Louise and Bruno Huber um, called Aspect Patterns, Aspect Pattern Astrology. And they develop these aspect patterns in traditional astrology aspects to about 45 configurations uh, it's a brilliant book if this topic interests you, but their limitation is that they're still only using the traditional aspects. When you start bringing in the quintiles and the septiles and, and the eleven tiles and others, the noviles and so on, all of a sudden you realize that it's about the music of the spheres. It's about the hum, not only in our own chart, but when two people get together, they make it's like hitting. It's like I'm one key on a piano and you're another key on the piano. And someone else is another key. And when we meet and we're together, those keys are being played at the same time. What kind of music does that make? And just because it's not based upon a traditional aspect, it still makes music. Mm. Rick, what, um, what role do, do harmonic aspects play in karmic relationships? Or do they, do they speak to karma? Do we have insights into karma? It's a trick question because... Tell me one thing that doesn't doesn't connect to karma. Right. I mean, you know, it's I mean, karma is just a it's a spiritual way of stating Newton's third law uh, of motion, which is to every action. There's an equal and opposite reaction, period. That's it. Um, in when people talk about, you know, either karma yoga or, or karmic astrology, they're normally talking about that, that you get what you deserve kind of a thing on a longer trajectory. Uh, I mean, people say I was this in my past life and I, you know, um, I, I killed, you know, someone or something like that. And in another lifetime, I da, 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 da. And this lifetime I'm living the best life I can because I'm trying to work out that old karma. I mean, that's often the, you, you hear that, that kind of story with, karma being something in the past. But the truth of the matter is that karma is created in every moment you breathe, every moment you talk, every moment you do something or don't do something, because you're creating karma in this moment for what happens in the next moment, 
or in the next life or sometime in the future. So, I mean, are these aspects karmic? Of course. The key is that sometimes things that are karmic, again, elude our perception because we don't see something connected to the past. I mean, this is as simple in our regular human individual neurotic lives. We do something and we forget that we're doing it because something happened when we were three or four years old and it set something in motion internally that made us fear something. And that when we see someone wearing the color yellow, it re-triggers some mo- something in our mind or something. Well, those kinds of things happen all the time and they're karmic. But the thing about working with the harmonic aspects and especially in relationships <clears throat> is that we make the invisible visible. And so, yes, these aspects can relate to karmic things because it's just another tool to make the invisible visible so that we can see that the hidden harmony is better than the obvious. Hmm. Can we see uh, <clears throat> can we see aspects of our own patterning from these? Like, So you just mentioned something that might have happened when we were three. And maybe we have, you know, abandonment issues from that moment in time. Do the quintiles, you know, do the tiles um, help us actually identify what those patterns might be? Well, again, they they might be. They're, They're not different than the traditional aspects in as much as they focus our attention onto a particular harmony. And so, yes, they certainly can help us um, see something, but they're not like a magic, you know, they're not, they're not like a panna, you know, a a, a panacea, um, a panacea that's just going to solve everything and make all of our past all of a sudden uh, become visible, but it does tune us into that. I mean, we take someone like Prince, you know, again, Prince, we don't, most people don't know a huge amount of his internal psychological workings from his past, but we know that something drove him to the level of, of, of inspiration that drove him to do what he did in his lifetime and how talented and brilliant and genius he was, whether you liked his music or not. There was something about what he did that touched something that in some ways was inspired by something in the past. And his chart, strong, strong septiles, we're coming back to them because they just make this case, again, informs us that he, as he lived his life, it was like he had helpers from the other side. You know, it was like something happened in his life early on that he could probably tell us what it was. Of course, we'd need a channel or someone who could um, to uh, communicate with a disincarnate being. But and and maybe there are people who know an intimate th- you know lot about Prince's life. I just don't. But the point is that yes, these higher harmonic aspects certainly can point back to things. But they're not going to be just some sort of magic thing that goes, oh, that means when he was, you know, four years old, um, he heard such and such play in a band. And then he bought, you know, I mean, something happened and then he got punished for listening to the music. And I, I, I'm making all this up. It has nothing to do with anything. But that's the kind of thing. It's not going to just point out, boom. Um, mm-hmm. But there are clues from these aspects. Hmm. You've mentioned Dane Rudyard's work quite a bit, quite a bit, and I know that he has an influence on our understanding of harmonic aspects. Can you talk to us a little bit more about him and what role he's played in in this harmonic aspect conversation? Yeah, Dane Dane Rudyard is an interesting character. Um, <clears throat> I'm someone who will um, I, I spend a lot of money on books, and I've bought books that were probably way too expensive, but university publications where a book can just, they they can just be very, you know, limited publishing. Well, I came across a book recently. It was $400. I did not buy it. um, Although I would accept it as a gift from someone. Um, And the book was an in-depth dive 
about the music theory of this guy named Dane Rudyard. And I went, what the hell? This is, this, I mean, how many people can be named Dane Rudyard? And I went and I did some exploration. And sure enough, this was our Dane Rudyard. Dane Rudyard, um, who wrote a, a, a numerous books, I don't know, eight, 10, maybe more books on astrology. Um, Dane Rudyard was uh, a Frenchman who came to the United States um, wrote in English, spoke English. Uh, I mean, he lived, he became a U.S. citizen. Um, he was a theosophist and, um, and he was born in the 1890s. I can't recall his exact birth date, but in the 1890s, um, it was an interesting time because there was a once every uh, 400 year Saturn, I'm sorry, a once every 400 year conjunction of Neptune and Pluto, the two slowest moving planets that we normally use. And during that period of time, we saw a real connection with things that were invisible, Neptune and Pluto aligning. And we saw, um, uh, we saw Sigmund Freud writing the interpretation of dreams, which started the whole depth psychology movement. Um, there was a lot of work um, being done in hypnotism, mesmerism, spiritualism, um, and theosophy, um, Christian science was on the rise then and, and, and was founded during that time and on the rise, and theosophy. And theosophy um, is, uh, a, mo many people have probably heard of the Theosophical Society, which still exists. It's not a religion per se, but it is a um, the perennial philosophy, as it's called, of um, spiritual traditions from multiple cultures. I'm talking about this because Dane Rudyard was a theosophist. And as a theosophist, he wasn't just an astrologer and he wasn't just interested in psychology and music and other things, but he had this more open view of what astrology was. And what Dane Rudyard did in the 20th century, his astrological writings kind of broke astrology out of the uh, fortune telling prediction. Um, and, and I have to say that, and, and some people, many people have heard this story of mine before. A lot of people get into astrology because something happens in their life. Uh, uh, someone leaves them, they're abandoned, uh, they have an accident, something happens, and all of a sudden their life is a mess and they go look at, um, to astrology or an astrologer and it all makes sense and they go, holy crap. And that's what starts their studies of astrology. This is like a really common story of how did you become astro an astrologer? Um, I became an astrologer because this happened to me. I went to an astrologer and wow, there are other stories. Like I became an astrologer because I didn't believe it and I wanted to disprove it. And now I'm an astrologer. My story is different. I was in college and I was studying psychology, thinking that I was going to become a therapist. And, um, and I was particularly enamored with the depth psychology of Jung and the connection of that from Freud to Jung to all the other um, lesser known but certainly important um, depth psychologists, the psychoanalytic movement and the psychodynamic movement. And someone came by my, my um, house where I was living at that time. I was a senior in college. And someone said, hey, I found this book. I thought you might be interested in it. And I was messing around a little bit with astrology, but it was really just a curiosity. I mean, it was an intriguing curiosity. And the name of the book um, was The Astrology of Personality. And it was written by Dane Rudyard. So this guy was like my first real depth journey into astrology. And the subtitle of the book um, the astrology of personality, and I won't have the words right, but it's something like a reevaluation of astrology in light of 20th century psychology and philosophy. That's what the book was. And it was a focus on revisioning astrology in light of Jungian psychology. And I was at that time just in in deep reading the Bollingen series, the series of Jung, the translations from German into English of Jung's entire writing. And I found this book. And by the time I was done reading it, I was hooked because I realized that astrology was not just about making a prediction. So Dane Rudyard's purpose in astrology or his role in astrology 
was to break astrology out of this thing from the past and bring it into the 20th century. And, and often he is considered to be the first of the humanistic astrologers. And humanistic astrology is kind of like this post-Jungian version of astrology that has now evolved um, into evolutionary astrology um, and all kinds of other labels and names on it. But one of the things that Rudyard wrote about that he focused on um, was the cycles of things, that astrology wasn't just about one chart and one moment, that every, every planet had its cycle. And that when you looked at aspects as points on a cycle, they began to take on a different meaning. And as such, we could just look at the moon, for example. We, we can see the simplest uh, visualization of the moon's cycle is a new moon and then a fortnight later. Fortnight is uh, a half of a moon cycle, two weeks. A fortnight later, we have a full moon. And then uh, two weeks later, we have a new moon. And then two weeks or one half of a moon cycle or one half of a month, one half of a month, we have a full moon. And then another half of that half of a cycle from new moon to full moon, Rajar said, is points on a cycle. Because we also have a first quarter moon and a third quarter moon. And that's what we call a week, because a week is a quarter of a moon cycle. And then Dane Rajar began to say, but we actually can break that moon cycle up into not just four points, you know, the conjunction, square, opposition, square, the new moon, first quarter moon, full moon, third quarter moon. He said, but we can actually break it up into eight sections so that we actually have a new moon and then a growing moon and then a first quarter moon and then a kind of waning moon and then an up, I'm sorry, then we have a, a, a gibbous moon that's nearly full. Then we have a full moon. Then we have a waning moon. Then we have a third quarter moon and then we have a crescent moon. And the, and he began to realize that there's lots more in the cycle. And Dane, Dane Rudyard wrote about these aspects that I'm talking about as points on the cycles. He did not. He might have used the word harmony. He was a musician. He was an accomplished enough musician that there's this $400 book that's a university press book about his contributions um, and his uh, uniqueness in the world of composing and of music. He understood what a harmony was. Obviously, he was a musician. He understood what a harmony was because he looked at aspects as harmonies. However, he did not necessarily, that I know of, use the word harmonic aspects, or did he use harmonic charts or harmonic astrology because the guy who brought in harmonic charts into astrology came from another direction in England, a guy named John Addy. I'm assuming that in his later years, Dane Rudyard was familiar with Addy's work, um, but it was John Addy in the 1950s and 60s that actually created what we call a harmonic chart. So there's nuances and fabulous history here of incredible people, but it was Dane Rudyard's student a guy named Michael Meyer, who wrote a book called The Handbook for Humanistic Astrologers. Uh, that name is also close. I'm doing this from memory. I don't have the book right in front of me. Um, but Michael Meyer, um, M-E-Y-E-R, and you can find this book on Amazon, I'm pretty sure. Um, this was my first real studying astrology book. And he wrote it as a student of Dane Rudyard. And in the section on aspects, Again, there's no mention in the book on of harmonics, but in the section on aspects, he has little diagrams and pictures and the angle and the meaning and how you delineate it of the conjunctions, oppositions, squares, sextiles, trines, quintiles, septiles, noviles, and it's like, I never knew that these were anything different. I just bought it all as, oh, these are all aspects. And so my journey into astrology as a beginning student, I just incorporated these, realizing that they were called minor aspects, but not really um, treating them as less important, but still looking at them. And for that reason, Dane Rudyard's importance in all of this is that he gave us 
um, he reinvigorated the interest in Kepler's um, semi-squares and sesquisquares, which are harmonic, eighth harmonic, one eighth of a circle. That's the Dane Rudjar um, eight points on the moon and which we now use. In fact, um, uh, Dimitri George's book on dark mysteries of the moon talks about that eight phase cycle of the lunar cycle in, in depth. Um, but Dane Rudjar introduced um, or, or, or reinvigorated interest in the semi-squares and sesquisquares. Remember, those were inventions or discoveries of Johannes Kepler and of the quintiles, the fifth harmonic, which were also a discovery or invention um, of Johannes Kepler. So that's the importance of Dana Rudjar in all of this, seminal importance. Um, and, and an astrologer who has affected every 21st century Every 21st century, I can't say that right. Every 21st century astrologer, whether or not they know it, there's not a, a modern astrologer who does astrology who has not been impacted by Dane Rudger. Mm. Well, thank you for helping us remain aware of the influences on the way that we're viewing things and practicing astrology. Okay, one more question the hidden, about the hidden, har the hidden harmony is better than the obvious. Yes, exactly. Okay, one more question about that hidden harmony. Yeah. This is a question that came in um, from the audience. How yeah. can you use harmonic aspects to foster greater understanding and empathy with your partners and loved ones? Great question. And I would actually back that up to how can you use any aspects because mm -hmm. harmonic aspects really should not be considered to be something separate from aspects. Ah. They're just the ones we forgot about or never <laughs> knew about, or they're the hidden harmonies, mm. but, but, but they in themselves will help Re remember. I mean, the magic thing about astrology is also that it shows the hidden harmonies. If you know nothing about astrology, and you meet someone with whom you have a dynamic and powerful relationship, but there's one thing in that relationship that makes you crazy. And, and, and let's say it's a spousal relationship. Um, and, and over the years, you maintain that relationship, but there's one aspect of it where every time something happens where you guys argue about it, there's no resolution and it's okay, you do it this way. You take out the trash on Tuesday and Thursday, no matter whether anything is in it or not. And I'll only take the trash out when it's full and whether it's a Tuesday or Thursday doesn't matter. I mean, it's a stupid little thing, but these are rhythms of how some people have very rigid rhythms here and other people do it in a different way. Now, you learn astrology and you learn that that person's Saturn is square your moon. Now, what it means is that person who's the Saturn person is, has some rigid structure, which may be very important and very useful, useful. And that is trash is picked up on Wednesdays and Fridays. And so on Tuesdays and Thursdays, they always take out the trash. If there's nothing there, if it's just a dirty sock, they take it down because that's their Saturnian rigid schedule. The moon is the rhythm of which we flow at home, so to speak. And so if my rhythm of flowing at home, my moon is 90 degrees to your Saturn, we might have some kind of just, you know, structural difference in how we approach certain things. Now, the astrology won't change that, but it can give us the sense of how we can respect the other person's rhythm. Now, having said that about traditional astrology, the same thing just goes further with the harmonic aspects. We begin to see more and more of the subtle complexities that are sometimes made invisible by the on the surface in your face dynamics, but they are there. And so I really think that when it comes to relationships, synastry, astrology, comparing my chart to anyone else's chart, your chart, or your chart to anyone else's chart, the real lesson, whether you're working with harmonic aspects or traditional aspects, is that we can respect something as natural or nature when we see it. In other words, that which we don't see, that which is invisible, becomes out of our mind, so we have no way to work with it. 
one of the most common things that people say after getting a good reading is, wow, I really feel connected with the universe. Because a good astrology reading helps one understand their natural hum with what's out there. And without judging things as good or bad, we can just simply understand the hum. Now the question becomes, how do I take some of those things which may be difficult in my life that I now see the hum about or the hum of, how do I kind of rope those in to make those either more socially acceptable, if that's a goal, or more productive or more manageable in my own life? But I can't work with something unless I can see it. This is Pluto's domain. Pluto is the underworld. It's the hidden. It's the unconscious. Well, in fact, the reason why these harmonic aspects in some ways are kind of like, not exactly, like the outer planets, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, um, Eris, Make, Make, so all the invisible planets that are, that are out there, is because they're not integrated. Things that are not integrated, Carl Jung said, appear as fate. Things that are integrated, we have some, some interaction with, so it's more a part of who we are. But if we don't integrate them, it things like, seems like things happen to us. And when we get to the um, first loudest uh, harmonic aspect um, after the quintile, which is the septile, Dane Rudyard called that the aspect of fate. Why? Because things happen from outside of our senses, and we're not sure why they're not integrated. So in answer to the question, in relationships, by stretching our awareness, starting with the fundamental aspects of the divisions by one, two, three, four, working with someone else's chart, the conjunction, one, the opposition, two, the trine, three, and the square, four, that's great. But then take it a step further, five. It doesn't jump to the sextile. It's just because astrologer ignores the five and goes and goes conjunction one, opposition two, trine three, square four, and then sextile six. Why don't we use five? Because it doesn't divide evenly into the zodiac. So just add that five and then six and then seven. And each successive number will give you another note on your musical scale to integrate another level of harmony, harmony that you can hear and that you move around through, but you don't have words for, and therefore it remains invisible. Mm. Okay, Rick, what is your greatest hope for the students of this class? Watch this. This is my mind. This is my mind on harmonics. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Everyone's on their own individual journey. And, and, and once, I, I, Amanda, I've been doing this for years. And I can't tell you how many astrologers who have been doing astrology uh, their whole life. I mean, astrologers who are my astrologers. Astrologers whose work I totally um, honor and respect. Um, and, and astrologers who I think are brilliant astrologers. I can't tell you how many of those I've sat down with and said, do you ever realize that your chart just absolutely rocks it on, on the septiles? And, and I show them and it changes how they look. They go, you know, I've been an astrologer my whole life and, and I, I've always known this piece about me. And I've always attributed it to the um, to the uh, Neptune Mars square, but it never it's always deeper than that. And and holy smokes, this just made my life and my chart come alive. I, mm. I mean, I and and this isn't I'm not looking for credit. This isn't about me. I'm just one of many astrologers. Um, and again, I always in this discussion bring up the work of my 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 brother David Cochran. No, he's not my real blood brother, but he's my astro brother because we were just born a few weeks apart, and we have we have very similar charts. Um, um, it, it, I'm in Aries; he's a Taurus, and so he's taken all this stuff that I work with, and he's turned it into a concrete school. That's what Tauruses would do, called vibrational astrology. And he has a different way of using the computer to quantify the things that I am talking about. And I consider myself kind of as a um, gateway drug. <laughs> In other words, because harmonics really disconnect from the chart. 
when you do a harmonic chart, that's different than looking at harmonic aspects. The difference is a harmonic chart takes all the points in your natal chart and it multiplies them by some arbitrary number, seven, the seventh harmonic. Mm. And then it creates a new chart that looks like no chart you've ever seen before. It doesn't exist in nature, but it's your seventh harmonic chart. And anything that's a <clears throat> anything that's a septile, biceptile, or triceptile in your natal chart will show up as a conjunction in your seventh harmonic chart because mm. it's seven folds on top of itself. The magic of that is that then oppositions will show half of septiles or half of a tri uh, so halfway between a septile and a biceptile and so on and then the and then the squares will show up the quarters of those and so what it does is it changes the lens on the microscope and it magnifies the septiles so now you're looking at an entirely different chart in a different world now this this course although I will discuss harmonic charts and we'll even do a short thing on how to calculate them that's not complicated but too complicated for now the course is not on harmonic charts the magic that only came about with the computer is that now i can do a chart on the computer and i can see the lower harmonics that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, maybe thirteen, maybe fourteen. But as I get higher and higher, the 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 numbers. Remember, an opposition is one hundred and eighty degrees. A square is ninety degrees. A half a square is forty five degrees. Um, a an eleven tile is thirty two degrees. Doesn't come out evenly. It's thirty two point two seven two seven two seven two. Um, but the thing is, is that the harmonic goes up. The distance between the planets gets smaller and smaller, so you can't see them on a natal chart wheel. I mean, there's been a tremendous amount of work that's been done with the 31st harmonic, with the 125th harmonic, but those create different charts, and they're hums that, that seem to be very powerful. With harmonic charts, we're looking at the aspects, but in the natal chart itself. So the difference between... What I'm doing and what David Cochran is doing is that what I'm doing is as a regular natal astrologer, just looking at a chart, you can see these aspects. What David Cochran is doing is taking this to a next level and using the computer to cycle through all these different harmonics and go in this group of people, the 19th harmonic is resonating, it's screaming, and these people all ride um, unicycles. And in this group, there are no 19th harmonics resonating and no one rides a unicycle. Does that mean that the 19th harmonic has to do with unicycle? I just made that up, by the way. That's not a real thing. But I'm showing you how particular these higher harmonics can get that is very different than what we're doing. We're simply back to what, what harmonics can bring into you. They can make this mind become this. Because just like astrology can make this mind become this, it opens and widens our view and, and, and gives us the ability to see more hidden harmonies that are always, thank you, Heraclitus, that are always better than the obvious. Mm. And I would think that with more awareness of the harm of the aspects and of that astrology brings, we're also getting more awareness of ourselves. So we're going like from this version of ourselves to this version of ourselves to this version of ourselves and just it keeps expanding and then the and amanda we can't in a relationship be more aware of a relationship or someone else unless we're more aware of ourselves the yes. idea that we're going to think of uh, of astrology as learning about something out there you know in my in my apprentice group i have about 30 people in an apprentice program some for up to four years now one of the things that we do is every month we get together and work on our own charts yeah. You know, this isn't about putting us in the center of the universe. This is about understanding that if we're not doing our own work, our own shadow work, our own development work, how can we see it in anyone else? Mm, so good. Thank you for broadening this conversation all the time. I mean, you do, that's what you do. 
But thank you for bringing in this particular element. And I love what you said earlier about not viewing it as separate from the other aspects. So not no, saying no. how do harmonic aspects help us with, with relationships, just how do aspects All help right, us? So here, here's something to think about. When I do a natal chart, um, I would no sooner do a natal chart without without quintiles than I would without Mars. Hmm. Not that there's any connection between quintiles and Mars, but you could do a chart without Mars and probably get by in a reading and not even know that you didn't have Mars in that chart. You know, you'd miss some stuff, but you, you could do it. And I feel mm. the same way about quintiles, that mm. when you look at a chart and don't use the quintiles and septiles in particular, which of all these aspects scream the loudest, mm. because the lower the harmonic, the louder the scream, the, the conjunction is louder than a quintile. Or, mm. or even a sextile, you know, that the, and so the, the, the point is that when you don't use these, you are missing something and that's okay. We're no matter how much we use, we're still missing something, but yes. these are not other than they're part of, just remember, this is your mind. This is your mind on harmonics. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Rick, where are you right now? Can you tell, like some people were wondering where you're at. Yeah, I'm at the LAX Hilton in Los Angeles. Um, wow. I flew in last night from Seattle, and I'm uh, in an hour. I'm going to be playing the flute at the opening ceremony of the Conscious Life Expo. Um, there are thousands. I, I can't even tell you. There's there's somewhere about 150 lecturers and teachers, um, and um, and I, I, I my guess is. Last year, there were maybe about three or 4,000 people, and that was still in COVID realms. Um, I, I think there could be six to 10,000 people here. This hotel is crazy buzzing. I'll be here for the next few days. If you're in the LA area, stop by. If you're in the LA area, um, I'll be doing a class on Saturday, tomorrow, on, surprisingly enough, the astrology of relationships moving beyond Venus and Mars. We're going to break out of you know, the gender roles, we're going to break out of traditional aspects, but that's my, my talk tomorrow. Mm -hmm. On Sunday, I'm on a panel. There are a number of other astrologers that are going to be lecturing and teaching. Um, our buddy Cameron, Cameron Allen's um, here and will be lecturing and um, and um, and uh, Leo King is here, another num number of other astrologers. Um, I'll be doing a post-conference workshop here on Sunday evening. Uh, on the astrology of the upcoming decade. Um, and so that's where I am. I'm in, I'm in Los Angeles at a random hotel. <laughs> oh my gosh. I so wish I could be there. If any of you are in the LA area, go check out Rick and our friends at the, what is it called exactly? Li it's called, uh, it's it, the CLE, the Conscious Life Expo. And Conscious it's Life. at the LAX Hilton, which is um, oh, there's the airport. I mean, we're on Century Boulevard. Anyone who knows LA, we're, you know, we're about uh, less than probably about a half a mile up from LAX. So this okay, is in so the heart of the beast. Apparently you need to play the flute on the Cosmic Connection because there's some people in the audience that don't realize you are also a musician, that you play the flute, I know amongst other uh, instruments as well, but maybe we can do that sometime. If maybe. you, if the you truth is, the, the truth is, I never consider myself a performer, although from second grade on, I played violin, piano, uh, I played orchestra up through high school orchestra, I played violin in the orchestra, I played a trombone and a baritone horn in the high school marching band, I, but I'm not a good performer, I'm not a performer. I, I love music, I love music theory, it informs all my astrology, it informs my interest in harmonics, and these days I play flutes, I mean, not, not this kind of flute, but this kind of flute, like classical uh, recorders and uh, Native American flutes, South American Balinese flutes, just you know, like more like whistles, penny whistles. I have, I love penny whistles too. Mm. All right. Well, you're definitely a performer here for us at Astrology Hub in this community for sure. Um, and maybe we could do the flute sometime. For those of you who can I'd make be happy it, to go check out Rick this weekend if you can't, but still want to hang out with Rick. Make sure you join the Foundations 3 class, astrologyhub.com slash foundations3. You do not have to have taken Foundations 1 and 2, although if you have, it's a totally natural progression. If you haven't, but you know basics about the chart, you know the basic aspects, and you want to take your knowledge. If you know planet signs and houses and the traditional aspects, you'll be fine. 
Totally. Okay. So that's available to you now. Um, you're not behind at all. Enrollment is still open. You will get immediate access to the first module if you join us now. So looking forward to that. And thanks, thanks to you all for being here. Thank you for hanging out with here with us here at the Cosmic Connection. Thank you for being a part of the Astrology Hub community. And we will look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. Rick, enjoy your weekend. Thank you, Take Thank you care. Amanda, for what you do. Thank you. All right. Did you know there's a whole universe that you can unlock with so-called minor aspects? Most astrologers don't even use them, but master astrologer Rick Levine calls them harmonic aspects, saying they're key to revealing the deeper metaphysical dimension of a birth chart, including the creative, mystical, and unseen parts of ourselves and others. And if you want a taste of how powerful they can be, just listen to what he has to say about some of the subtitles in play during his February and March forecast. There's one other thing that happens in February. By the 12th, Venus makes a septile. That's one seventh of a circle to Pluto. Venus makes a septile to Uranus. Boom, boom. What are septiles? They're otherworldly. They're supernatural. Dane Rudger said they were fated. Things come out and things come through that were somehow in other realms. And like Uranus, it's like lightning striking. And I think the combination of Mercury going into Uranus's modern sign of Aquarius and all these septiles will awaken us to the idea that we don't see everything that we think we do. Of course, it's not lost on me that this is the first week of Foundations Level 3 course. And it's just such an overwhelming septile message that we get from the universe. I really think that there's going to be a bit of a wake up in mid-February. If you're ready to uncover these powerful unseen aspects in your chart, join us for Astrology Foundations Level 3 with Master Astrologer Rick Levine at astrologyhub.com slash foundations3.